It's now my pleasure to introduce Penny Queller. And before I introduce Penny from Alexander Mann Solutions, I want to share some exciting news. At HRO Today, in our magazine, online, on our website, um, we, we talk about what's happening within the industry and we share news. So something very relevant I thought would be exciting to share with you that has just happened at Alexander Mann. They are a global leader in providing talent acquisition and management solutions. And yesterday they announced they were selected by Verifone to provide end-to-end -to -end talent acquisition services across their global footprint. And I know Alexander Mann Solutions brings um, a wealth of experience working with other technology-led organizations as well as global financial uh, services sector. And I know they're looking forward to applying that experience as they help Verifone meet its talent acquisition challenges around the world. So congratulations to Alexander Mann Solutions on that win yesterday. And it is now my pleasure to introduce you to Penny, who is responsible for the company's business development and growth strategies in the Americas. Please join me in welcoming the SVP at Alexander Mann Solutions, Penny Queller. Thank you very much, Zachary, for that wonderful introduction. I'm not going to dance like Zachary did, and thank goodness there's no music or I'd be tempted to. Um, just wanted to um, extend a warm thank you to Elliot and the HRO Today team. We are so pleased, Alexander Mann Solutions is, for the opportunity to sponsor the Wharton track. So that's, that's what we're doing here. That's our responsibility relative to the conference. Um, Peter, thank you in advance for the meaningful content that you're going to deliver to us. So just a snippet about our company. So Alexander Mann Solutions, we are 20 years old this year. We're a talent acquisition company, and we hail a global footprint. There's not a lot of companies in our space that can say that they're 20 years old. We are led by our CEO and founder, Rosalind Blair. We're pleased to be recognized by HRO Today's RPO Baker's Dozen um, almost every year. In particular, um, we feel very good about being recognized about the size and the complexity of the engagements that we deliver upon. We hail a strong foundation from our UK corporate offices where we were founded, but we're enjoying meaningful growth globally, um, especially in the Americas. With many new clients, including um, the one that Zachary um, gave us the pleasure of announcing to you all, um, which is Verifone. Um, the Verifone engagement um, will not only provide them um, global talent acquisition services for full-time hires, but also we're taking the accountability for global contingent labor hires as well. So without further ado, I would like to um, uh, in bring Elliot to the stage, as well as Peter Capelli, and um, carry on with the Wharton track. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you, Penny. Uh, thanks to Alexander Mann for, uh, you know, uh, supporting our effort at HRO today. So as we thought about what to do uh, for this event, you know, one of the things that sort of has been going on in, at least in the Americas, is we're watching tons of town halls, okay? And I thought it would be interesting because a lot of times we have people up here, keynotes or whatever, you know, we had Dr. Beverly Kay last year, to actually just have an interactive town hall on HR. So that was the original premise. Um, I approached Peter, he thought I was crazy, um, still does. But he agreed to take part in it. Uh, and what we are going to do is actually have the audience ask some questions. I'll act as the moderator, may sort of explore a little bit what, what Peter says, but we also may come back to audience members, your discretion, and, and ask you what you think. So the big difference between this and what you see on CNN or Fox News is we promise not to lie, okay? <laughs> Ask us direct questions, we won't pivot, we won't lie, we'll just try to answer it, okay? So, with that being said, um, ironically, uh, this question came in uh, several, uh, about a week and a half ago, and last night I actually had a slide that references uh, automation. So it was Kevin uh, Stakelum from Humana, Talent Acquisition Director of Humana in the audience. Kevin? All right, I guess he's not, not here, he ducked. 
All right, so here was the question that, that Kevin uh, is the town acquisition director of Humana. So Peter, there's a lot of talk about how robots, and remember last night I had a slide with a robot on it, uh, and this came in, you know, uh, no one had seen that deck yet, about how robots, either software programs or robots themselves, will play a key role in business of the future due to the, the declining supply of talent. So there's sort of an inherent assumption there. Um, and how likely do you think that really is and what impact do you think it will have on talent acquisition in HR? So robots, what do you think robots are gonna do? Is it, are we all gonna become irrelevant in the future because of uh, how? Okay, good, yeah, thanks Elliot. And I, I did wanna point out for those of you who were at dinner last night that my clothes did arrive finally. <laughs> <laughs> Nine o'clock this morning they arrived. Uh, although uh, the beauty of modern outsourcing is uh, America now outsources this to some company that now delivers it to the hotel. So you can follow where it is when it's not with you. <laughs> and apparently it arrived at the airport at nine o'clock last night. And then it took a tour of Chicago and I could follow the tour around uh, before, it, before it got to me. Um, well, I think just to follow up one quick thing on Elliot, we, I think what we would like to do is to hear what you folks are experiencing on some of mm -hmm. these things as well. So, but here's the story about robots. Uh, if you had to pick the point with the fastest technological change in modern times, when do you think it would be? It's your guess. You can just shout out the period. It, it, let me, it is absolutely not now. We're not even close. Sorry, when? Which one? The, uh, well, yeah, I guess it depends when, when you think that counts, but um, if you turn back the clock to bef just before the 1920s, right, in about a six-year period, we got radio, electricity, telephones, and cars. The iPhone, Apple 6, doesn't count as a big revolution compared to that stuff, right? And if you look in modern times, it was the 1960s. Every generation thinks that what they're experiencing right now is the fastest change because we just lose perspective on this, right? But actually the technological change we're experiencing right now is not that big. It's really not that big. You, maybe we're seeing it more in our phones because that's what everybody is telling us about. And the biggest changes in the way the workplace work have had nothing to do with technology. You know, the decision by employers a generation ago to start laying off white collar workers, for example. Or the biggest change in modern times is to stop promoting people from within and to start hiring from the outside laterally. I think that's the, been the biggest change in terms of how it affects us. Or if you were in a room like this, Elliot, a generation ago, um, this would have been all HR people inside companies because there really weren't any vendors, right? I mean, that's been the biggest change in, in our lives and has largely nothing to do with technology. Uh, what drives technological innovation in the workplace? It's substituting capital for labor. Um, and one of the things that's easy for us to forget is particularly at the entry level, if you think about entry level workers in retail, for example, we're paying in real terms, depending how far back you wanna go, about a third or half as much for those people as we did a generation or so ago. So the pressure to innovate and substitute technology for those folks really has not been there. If you go to the third world, for example, and you see a construction site, uh, you'll see, depending where you are, people carrying cement on their heads, walking around with buckets of cement. And it's not because people don't know about wheelbarrows there. It's because hiring people to carry cement on their heads is cheaper than buying wheelbarrows because labor is so cheap, right? So we start seeing innovations in technology to replace people when labor starts getting really expensive. And that hasn't happened. In fact, we've been going the other direction in the last 10 or 15 years ago. So there really hasn't been much pressure to do anything about substituting capital for labor in a big way, right? Not like the way we have seen in previous generations. Now, is that gonna change? Well, one of the myths is the supply of labor in the U.S. is declining. That's absolutely not true. The labor force in the U.S. is not declining. The population is not declining in the U.S. Uh, the labor force is, continues to grow at a slightly slower rate than before, but that assumes, for example, that baby boomers continue to retire at 65. If you want a, a, a life-altering experience, take a quick look at longevity tables to see how long you're gonna live. You can put the data in with respect to your basic attributes. 
And I guarantee you for almost everybody in the room here, it's well into the 90s now, assuming you don't already have a serious illness. And one of the things about baby boomers, which we'll get back to in a minute, and retirees, retirees forever have reported that they wanted to keep working in some way. So three quarters of people approaching retirement say they'd like to keep working in some way. Only about a quarter of them ever are able to do it because people won't engage them. Right? And so if we're worried about a shrinking labor supply, first of all, that's false, it's not happening. Uh, and you wanted to find a group of people to go hire, these folks who are approaching retirement and want to work in different ways are a huge pool of skilled folks that we could touch right, and grab. So are robots going to replace us? You know, there are always jobs where technology replaces people. And they're happening now. One of the things that's a little different is we're seeing more of this in the white-collar workforce. Uh, we used to never see it in the white-collar workforce. It was all blue-collar. We're seeing more of that now in the white-collar. So it seems more real because it's affecting us uh, in a way that it did not in the past, right? So there's always going to be some jobs where that happens. People have worried back to the 1700s that technology eliminates jobs. But what happens is it eliminates jobs over here and it creates them over there. And that's been the story for the last 300 years since the Industrial Revolution started. Now, will something fundamental change about that? Well, maybe, but we don't know that. You know, the, the great American sports writer Damon Runyon once wrote that the race is not always to the swift nor the battle to the strong, but that's the way to bet. And if you look at the last 300 years, the bet has been technology on balance does not eliminate jobs. It eliminates them over here. It creates them over there. Where it's going to eliminate them, that's hard to predict. Right? Well, you know, it's interesting. When at our event in Singapore a couple of years ago, someone brought in, and this may scare people in the room, a robotic recruiter. Okay? And you sit down, and, and it's no different than an assessment platform, but it has a personification. So there's a voice that talks to you. And you know, I went through an interview with the robotic recruiter, as did some of the other attendees. And you know, the re recruiter says to you, um, hi, my name is Hal, which is kind of scary, or whatever the name was, I don't remember. And then it, it, it says, what's your name? And if I said, well, my name is Peter Capelli, it would say, I don't think you're being quite truthful. It was trained to read facial expression, changes in uh, you know, your corneas and, and whatever, and could actually determine whether or not someone was being completely truthful, partially truthful, whatever. And there was this uh, chill that went through the crowd, right, because there were a lot of providers in the room. But every one of those robots had to be supported by two programmers to extract the you know, programmer and a data analyst. So at the end of the day, if you really thought about it, to your point, it actually was creating jobs, just not recruiting jobs. It was creating technology jobs. Point about that, there are things that are technologically possible that are really expensive and difficult to do. So for example, in the 80s, there used to be a joke in the airline industry that said, what will the cockpit of the future look like? It said it will have a pilot and a dog. And the pilot's job is to feed the dog, and the dog's job is to keep the pilot from touching the controls. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and for the last generation or so, it's been possible to fly airplanes without pilots in them at all. Uh, but why don't we do that? Because it still seems creepy, right? Uh, it's been possible to, to have doctors eliminated and put your symptoms in uh, on a computer and do it that way, but it feels creepy, so we don't do it. So the fact that technology allows some things, like some of these fancy robots and things that they can do are pretty amazing, but the robots cost so much more than hiring a person to do it that we don't see them, right? So the fact that technology is possible doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to replace jobs, at least not yet, right? Yeah, the, the, the creepy factor. And I, and I was driving in San Francisco um, through a neighborhood and looked over and the car next to me had no driver. Mm. It was a test car for Google Maps, mm. okay? And, and my initial reaction was, I want to get away from this thing as fast <laughs> as I can, okay? Because just using Google Maps to get, like, your Uber is hard enough. All right, so is uh, Callie Pike from Cisco here? There you are. Callie, would you ask your question? Can we get a mic over to Callie? Soon there'll be robots getting you mics, Callie. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> just right. Come right over. Hi, um, I am Callie Pike. I started at Cisco in February, so I'm a new grad from NC State. Um, and I am a human resources representative. So as I've come into um, 
the business world, I've noticed that a lot of companies are trending um, and are getting rid of their performance appraisals, evaluations of employees. And I know that this is the new thing. This is um, a revolution to HR, but I also hear the other side of it where employees are concerned that they aren't getting the feedback that they want to hear. So I just want to know what your um, thoughts are on that. Uh, we have a session on that this afternoon, so maybe we just say a little bit uh, on that. I can tell you what uh, lots of companies are doing. Let's maybe just have a show of hands. How many of you in the room here, your companies have either changed your human resource performance appraisal processes in some fundamental way, or you're about to? Just have a show of hands. How many folks, right? So. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is a big number. What do you? What's your guess? A third or half in the oh, room here? I'd say more than uh, than half. Uh, so it's a big number, right? Are, are changing already. Um, some of the surveys suggest about a third of companies in the U.S. are doing it. Uh, I think what's interesting is a lot of the companies that people follow, like GE, which is a company that maybe is the most responsible for the old model of performance appraisals hanging around, has given up doing performance appraisals. Uh, and I guess the question is, is that or we're going to get into trouble giving up performance appraisals. Let me just say one quick thing about this, and that is we don't want to live in a revisionist uh, uh, moment and assume that the old model of performance appraisal actually worked, right? So sometimes what you hear people say, well, um, how are we going to identify bad performers to dismiss people without performance appraisals? How, do, how well did it work so far, folks? I mean, how, how often did you run into a situation where a line manager would identify somebody as a bad performer early on and then complete the appropriate information and feedback to that person, call you in, put them in a performance improvement plan, and off you go, right? The problem is they would give people good performance appraisals, and then they come to you a, a year or two later and say, get rid of this guy. She's terrible, right? Uh, that's the, pr the reality of this is the old model was not working. If it actually worked as we were hoping it would work, we wouldn't be having this discussion, right? And the fact is that most people don't get useful feedback at the end of the year performance review for things, if you think about it, that they've been doing over the course of a year, right? There's what did I do, then there's how much of that did my supervisor actually see, and then how's my supervisor coding it? I'd say a year goes by and my supervisor's trying to condense all that together and to give me a report at the end related to what I did almost a year ago uh, and am I even hearing what they're telling me at that point? So here's what the research shows about performance appraisal scores. The best predictor of your scores are actually your demographics and how they map to your supervisor's demographics. So supervisors give higher scores to people who are more similar to them, uh, and that's the best predictor of your scores. It's not your actual performance that's the best predictor, right? So the performance appraisal process is not working right now. And so that's the place to start, uh, rather than with a kind of an idealized version of how it's supposed to be working. And then where are we going to go with it is an interesting question. Uh, and I think the way people want to go with it is this continuous conversation thing, right? And I think everybody recognizes if you could do that, that would be great. If you can get supervisors to really have conversations with people along the way, when problems come up, when successes come up, right then what you should do about it, that would be great. Uh, the question is, is that going to happen, right? Uh, and right now, many people believe that the end of the year exercise actually inhibits that conversation along the way because supervisors think, well, I'll put it in their appraisal. I've got to talk to them about it anyway, right? It's just be a year later by the time I talk to them. So there's some evidence that it actually prevents people from having those continuous conversations. Um, but it's a culture change in these organizations, right? And the question is going to be whether the people at the top are willing to make this a priority and make it happen. So far at the companies that are doing this, like IBM, like PwC, Deloitte, Accenture, the pressure is coming not from HR, it's coming from the top. And just one career management issue I would offer to, to folks here, if you think there's a lot of problems with this alternative, it's important maybe to, to raise them, but I would not throw myself in front of the bus of change in performance appraisals because what you'd be defending is the least popular practice in management, right? And you don't want to be the person defending that. You know, let the bus go by maybe a little bit and suggest some ways to improve things, but I don't think you want to be defending 
this practice which everybody hates right now? Well, you know, it, it's interesting. You, uh, you know my feeling on this. Remember, I think it was two years ago at the, uh, the CHRO awards dinner, I, I made a comment about one of the companies had done away with performance appraisals. Yep. Asked, and the audience sort of groaned a little bit. And I asked people who like, I, I, I think they're terrible the way it's done today. So people sort of hissed a little and they, you know, I said, how many people here like, you know, sitting through a review process, about half of them raised their hand. I said, great, I want you to go home tonight and do one with your spouse, <laughs> okay? And you saw a lot of hands. I said, how many are still in favor of it? And all the hands came down, <laughs> okay? It doesn't feel good, but you mentioned, for example, IBM uh, and uh, PwC is, is ones that have gone to this sort of continuous conversation, yep. yet IBM has had struggles with their you know, performance and, and how the company is, has done. Are, are there companies that you, where you can say that they've made the switch and there's, there's some measurable positive effect or, or that, that they're very successful and they've had a great model that, yeah. com that you've either studied and, or that's been written about? Well, I, IBM people, was in trouble before. Their problems yeah. were largely before this. The oh, yeah, one absolutely. that you can point to is Microsoft. Where, got any Microsoft folks in the room? Uh, that many people believe that Microsoft's forced ranking system was a big part of what got them into trouble because they couldn't get engineers willing to move to other groups or to take on new projects for fear they'd be at the bottom of the performance of the group they were moving into. Right? So a lot of people believe Microsoft gave up their system because it was causing them big performance problems. And things that Microsoft seemed to have proved, improved afterwards. You know, it's very difficult to find any link between any individual practice and company overall performance. And by the way, that's not just an HR issue. That's true in marketing or strategy or anything else. You know, overall organization performance is so complicated. There's so many things that drive it. They're trying to tell a story about any one practice is kind of a fool's errand, I guess. But at least in terms of the innovation side, Microsoft reports much better, right? All right, so I'm gonna take one more of the, the present question. Maybe we'll take some from the audience, if yep. you're of a mind to do that. Is Erwin Krut here from the new school? Yes. Erwin, <laughs> ask your question. We'll get you a microphone momentarily. I, I, I have a big mouth, but thank you. This is a big room. <laughs> um, Zachary actually uh, already gave you a prefiguring of my question, and we didn't talk about it beforehand. Um, I, I would characterize it as it's hard to drain the swamp when you're up to your knees in alligators. Um, that old question. Um, the pace of technology may not be changing all that fast anymore, but the change of regulations and the kinds of things that we're required to do from an HR perspective to keep our companies and organizations out of trouble just keeps expanding enormously. Um, of course, there's not a whole lot of additional staffing to go along with that. Uh, and so my question really is, uh, aside from the initial discussion of keeping it simple that we had this morning, how do we, or what are the most successful strategies for being able to balance that desire that we all have to be in key strategic business partners with the need to do what we have to do, which is spreadsheets and regulatory uh, monitoring? Right, so if you've got a big compliance agenda, how do you get strategic with that, right? Um, I have a colleague that some of you may uh, know, Phil Miscamara, who's now on the National Labor Relations Board. And uh, Phil was a, uh, is an MBA graduate from Wharton and also a, a law school graduate from Penn. And uh, Phil used to say that uh, the job of being a lawyer, like a general counsel, right, is to help the employer do what the employer wants to do and stay out of trouble. So what that meant was you are giving your employers, you're giving your bosses in the company, the operating executives, the options, right? That say here are the options in terms of things we could do that would keep us out of trouble. These practices get us closer to trouble. It's rarely ever black and white, can't do this, can do this, right? Now there's always some shades of gray and managing the choices right, are what somebody in the general counsel's office does. And I think on the employee relations side, which is what we're talking about here right, with regulations, it's kind of, I think it's the same way. And that is to give the bosses at the top the options. Here are the choices, here are the constraints. 
uh, what do you want to do? I can help you figure out how to do it, right? Uh, but no one at the top, I think, reacts well to being told, can't do this, can't do that, can't do that. Right? Uh, but maybe we t throw this open for just a minute. Anybody found a way through this? Anybody on the employee relations side got any thoughts on how to manage this? Yourselves, guys who found a way through? If, if I can, I just want to amplify that. Among other things, um, we have in New York City, where I'm based, a yep. uh, new New York City sick leave policy, which yep. is really complicated yep. to administer, and it's taking right. a lot of our time. We have a new family leave policy coming up uh, that will be in effect January 1st of next year. Um, there are the Fleecer rules changes that are going to be changing over the summer. It's, so it, it's not just on the employee relations side, it's really on yeah. the mechanics side of taking Compliance. everything yeah. that we're doing and reconfiguring it on the fly. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the uh, options there, of course, is to outsource this, right? Uh, because the payroll providers at least claim that they are on top of this stuff, and they're probably more on top of it than any individual employer would be. Uh, at least they claim to do that, right? And so if you've got really complicated and ever-changing stuff you've got to manage, one of the questions for yourself is, is this our core competence as HR? Can we do this? How many people have we got to manage? How big a deal is this for us? Should we be letting somebody else do that? And maybe the answer here is on that stuff. Maybe somebody else does it, right? Elliot, what do you think? What do we got? A few minutes left? Yeah, we have a few Open minutes left. So um, questions, let's see who wants to yep. ask a question. All right. Penny, it's your show, let's go. All right, you can ask a question. Peter, um, in the HR practice as a whole, what's the biggest opportunity that you see that maybe we as practitioners globally aren't putting enough investment or energy or yeah. focus on? Yeah. Well, that's uh, not a big question, yeah. Peter. No, I think that's we can not a big so, question. Uh, so <laughs> how many of you got a copy of that Harvard Business Review cover with a bomb on it that said blow up HR, right? Uh, yeah, sorry about that. That was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my article's in there. They didn't ask me about the bomb, so that's my article behind that. Uh, uh, they didn't ask me about the bomb or the title, the blow-up thing. Um, and in there I outline a lot of this stuff, but I would say the biggest opportunity uh, is to think about how to support businesses doing projects. Because I think we've been hung up, hung up trying to support the strategy of the organization or the strategy of the business. And most businesses these days don't have clear strategies that are consistent. They change all the time. And organizations which are not businesses often don't have strategies at all, right? Healthcare, et cetera. They've got projects that they do. And I think the opportunity is to find the projects and raise your hands and be able to say, we could help you with this project. Here's what we know about how to do it. So my favorite example of this in Philadelphia is what happened, happening with Comcast, right? So Comcast is trying to reinvent itself and get better at software. And they've concluded they need 5,000 good software people to come to Philadelphia and staff their new tower of technology or whatever they're calling it, right? How do you do that? Philadelphia is wonderful at many things, but we're not a tech hub or a software hub. So how are they gonna do that? They wanna get these guys from Silicon Valley and Austin and New York to come move to Philadelphia. Well, the HR guys raised their hand and said, we can help you do that. Uh, here's what it's gonna require. And they laid out a model which is pretty compelling. Uh, the first thing they did is they said, what's our employee value proposition here? Uh, you can live in Philadelphia, you can afford to buy a house, first of all. You can't do that in Silicon Valley. Um, you could actually own a house and walk to work. Uh, you could send your kids to schools which are not dangerous, right? We've got good schools, good quality life. We're offering you a career here that is stable and you could actually function in this place for quite a period of time. We only need 5,000 people, we don't need everybody to come. And they found the people who were born in Philadelphia and raised in Philadelphia and are now working in Silicon Valley. You want to come home? They found those guys and went to get them. They found the people from Philadelphia who are now in school doing double E degrees at Berkeley or Stanford or any place else. You want a summer job back in Philadelphia, right? They have a four or five point attack to go get these guys, right? And bring them to Philadelphia. And I think if they hadn't raised their hands and said, ah, we can help you do that, it might not have happened. They wouldn't be able to succeed. So I think the, the strategy is to get down to the project level where I think we're going to have to raise our hands and say, we could help you do that. Or we're about to outsource a call center to this company over here. What's the biggest problem engaging a call center? It's whether they can deliver. The biggest predictor of that is their own turnover, right, of employees. Are they stable enough? HR folks, we could raise our hands and say, we could help you sort that out, right? So I think being able to volunteer, raise our hands, 
and say, here are projects that business is about to do and we could help you do them and here's how, uh, is the opportunity that we're missing. Who else got a question? Yeah, yes, sir. Um, so we talked about technology has not historically eliminated jobs. Um, one thing we're seeing with an increase in reliance to technology um, seems to be the uh, need to use it, everything from video interviewing um, all the way to uh, extended workforce uh, or flexible workforce. That said, do you see that as per, uh, creating any issues um, around uh, access to jobs? So for instance, if I have to do a video interview, I need a reliable broadband access. Yeah. Yeah. Not everyone yeah. has that. Yeah, no, that's a great, a great question, Matt. Uh, and uh, by the way, Matt was just, I have a radio show, Matt was just on the radio show, Sirius XM, Channel 111 Business Radio, powered by the Wharton School. So wasn't it fun? I, it was a good time, so I figured I'd ask you a question this there time. There you go. So if we call you and ask you, would you like to be on the show, please come in. Elliot was on too, right? So I was on, it was so a lot of fun. Uh, so come on the show. Uh, the question um, about uh, technology and access is very important, right? If you're worried about um, disparate impact, for example, and your interviews require that somebody have broadband access, you are probably cutting off a proportion of the population that you are missing and maybe you don't want to miss them. I'd say it's less a case if you're interviewing for managerial roles, of course. But if you're interviewing for frontline workers in a city like Chicago and you require that people have broadband access to do the applications, you're probably gonna bump up against some problems. And in particular, you're missing a ton of people uh, who could be good workers. We had a program a couple days ago at Wharton and we had the CEO of ShopRite, uh, and I'm sure that he wouldn't mind me telling you this story. Uh, they have a program of employing convicted ex-felons. Oh, right? Jeff Brown. Uh, yeah. yeah, and okay. uh, one of the things that he's found is particularly former drug dealers um, disproportionately make it into management uh, in ShopRite. They're terrific workers and the reason is because they've got business skills already. Uh, and he says they understand profit margins and things like that, and off they go. Uh, and a lot of those folks don't have broadband access, and they would be missing them if they didn't have some way to collect those applications and reach out and contact folks. We got time for what, one more maybe? One more question. Yep. Or if you know a drug dealer, you want to refer for a job. <laughs> <You're right>. um, <laughs> We pick one more out of your, I think you had one more on your list, right? We have one more on our list, so let's go uh, see if we can go with that. And this one's sort of a, a is, is uh, Holly uh, Thorwald here? All right, there you go, Holly. Sort of a big question, but we'll try to do it quickly. Go ahead. Okay, um, my question is, in light of all the changes we're seeing in the workforce today with millennials making up almost 46% of the workforce and baby boomers retiring by the thousands every day. What, what can you recommend as some recruitment, quick, in the next few minutes, some recruitment strategies to not only attract but to retain, especially based on these gen generational differences? Yeah, well, uh, first, and for some of you probably heard me talk about this, there's no evidence that there are generational differences at all. They're age differences, right? So 22-year-olds behave differently than 36-year-olds. That's kind of always been true, right? Uh, and the reason that matters, it, you do have to know how to recruit to 22-year-olds if you're trying to recruit 22-year-olds. The problem is if you assume those 22-year-olds are gonna act the same way when they're 36 or 48, you got a problem, because that's not true, right? And if you try to stand your company on its head, to accommodate 22-year-olds, you're gonna piss off the 40 and the 50 and the 60-year-olds, right? So it's always been true that people of different age groups had different preferences and values and things. And so paying attention to those kind of matters. Now here's the interesting thing. If you look at what younger workers say they want and older workers, right, they're almost identical, right? They want more meaningful work, they want work-life balance, they want flexibility, and the reason is the outliers are the folks in the room here, most of us, particularly people with children, right? Um, we're the different group, and the reason is because we've got all these obligations. You know, you've got kids you can't pick up and move, uh, you're stuck in your current house, you can't, you know, and you need money because kids are really expensive, right? So being able to figure out how to, how to accommodate the recruiting interests of older workers and younger workers, and in some ways it's the, the fact that, that they want similar things in some ways makes it, makes it easier, and particularly for the alternative work schedule folks, 
you got this huge pool of older workers, which is way bigger than the millennials, by the way, if you're worried about you know, whatever the hell the millennials are. Uh, if you think that's your target audience, you got a much bigger pool of people in the older worker group who are already skilled, who already have the behavioral skills, who all the evidence suggests, by the way, that job performance increases as people get older because experience matters. Now, here's the quick test on this. If you were to go to a hospital, right, and somebody said, give me the oldest doctor, you'd think that was funny. But if you said, give me the most experienced doctor, you would say that makes perfect sense, right? The issue is experience and age just happen to be perfectly correlated, right? So I well, would think that you want to spend some time trying to track that older population, which is really where the opportunities are. Right, and I've read the research, we've talked about this, um, but I, I want to see what the audience thinks because I, I see what the research says, but how many people think that millennials are very different to deal with? I hear a lot of talk about, raise your hands if you think millennials are difficult or are, are hard to re harder to relate to than perhaps prior generations. Some of you, like I'm a boomer, so I've lived through Gen X and now we've got millennials, et cetera, and the sort of Gen Y sub cohort. How many people think millennials are a different breed and therefore a little bit different to handle? You can raise your hands higher. No one's gonna rat you out, for God's okay. sake. Okay, let, let okay. me rat you out here. How many of you baby boomers in the room uh, smoked dope when you were kids? <laughs> well, the, the data suggests that a conservative estimate is 60%, right? And we have conveniently forgotten all that stuff, right? So, uh, and if you think millennials, if you think young kids today are irresponsible, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just ask yourself this question. What did your parents say about you when you were 22, right? Doesn't it sound exactly the same? I can tell you, as baby boomers, we were told that we were the laziest, most unkept, most ungrateful generation ever, and they may have been right. Uh, and now they call us the workaholic generation. Now, how the hell did that happen? I'll tell you the answer. We just got older, that's all. And we got kids and we got responsibilities, right? So this idea that we know kids today are different, uh, we also, the thing we really know is our ability to be objective about these things is close to zero, right? And to sort out, is it age, is it generation, is it circumstance, is virtually impossible. Well, right? you, you, you know, I, I told you about the quote I found from like 1923 where, Tell were, basically it was an article and it was uh, that the current generation, and I, I did this in a, a keynote I gave, the current generation is, is shiftless and lacks the discipline necessary to be successful in a commercial enterprise and went on about lack of discipline and focus and that they were much too interested in their leisure. And the quote's from 1923, okay? So you think about that was an economic boom time, very similar to when some of the millennial kids were, were growing up. I, I think though that, that one of the things that I think there is an issue with, and I, I have these like, I have these thoughts when I shouldn't be thinking about like HR, all right? So I, I've been, I'm divorced, I've been dating a wonderful gal for about four years, in fact, you met her. And, um, but she's a Jersey girl. And when you date a Jersey girl, there are certain things you just gotta reconcile to. Hey, careful. All right, how many people are from, all right, if you're from Jersey, raise your hands. Ooh, okay, look. all right, keep your hands up for a minute. What how many it? people from Jersey have been to a Springsteen concert? <laughs> all right, all, everyone, everyone goes to Bruce Springsteen, right? So Springsteen, I'm at the, I'm, I, I, for her birthday, I, I got tickets to his performance in Philadelphia. And what I started to think about, I think I told you this, is I think that one of the generational rifts that we're experiencing right now has nothing to do with values, age, discipline, whatever. All these people in the audience were my age, right? I'm in my mid 50s, and they were mid 50, like 50 to 60 years old. The vast majority of the demographic. I mean, Springsteen's like 67, and everyone's in there wearing their Fitbits, up on their feet for three and a half hours, dancing to the music. We're not going away. Like by the time our parents were our age, they were turning the reins of society over to the next generation. Boomers aren't leaving. Like, we're, we believe, and, and there's all kinds of studies, I mean, the health club generation, now I might not be the best poster boy for that, but the truth be told, like, we actually believe we're going to live forever. Like Peter just said, your mortality table says 90s, we're all sitting there going, oh no, 
I'm going way longer than that. <laughs> so, really? so I think that there's an issue with that that, that, that takes place yeah. in the generational cohort coming up now, that, yeah. that we're, yeah. we are actually yeah. clogging the dam at the top. That might be true. And, uh, but I think also for these folks, just to, sort of to your point, they grew up hearing that you have to manage your own career and that companies have no loyalty to you, right? Which is different than us. We grew up hearing something different, right? And people their whole lives have told them, you gotta manage your own career, you gotta manage your own, you gotta look out for yourself, right? So they're doing what we told them to do and now it's a little bit surprising to see it. Right? I, I know we could sit here all day. Uh, please, a big round of applause for Professor Capelli. Uh, <clears throat>